Good morning and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz and I'm our Vice President for External Relations here. And, and I am honored to be introducing my friend, uh, my colleague Grant Aldonis, who uh, for so long here at CSIS, uh, our offices were next to each other. And so I got to hear some of the most fascinating conversations. You, you just can't <laughs> even imagine. And, 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 you, and, and all of you who know Grant, and I know that there's many of you in this room um, who, who know Grant personally, um, know what a fascinating person he is. This is a person who has served in the highest levels of government, who has practiced law at the highest levels in Washington, who knows how to play a mean blues guitar, uh, and, and many other skills. Um, but, you know, I don't need to go through Grant's long and distinguished bio, but some of the highlights are is that, you know, before Grant came to CSIS, he, he worked with um, the great Bob Strauss at, at Aiken Gump, where he um, took over Bob Strauss's trade practice, which is no small thing. Um, before that, Grant, uh, of course, was Under Secretary of Commerce uh, in the first four years of the Bush administration and was one of the key uh, economic and policy advisors to the President and to the President's economic team. Uh, prior to that, Grant, uh, of course, was uh, at Miller and Chevalier and he, and he served many years on the Hill. Um, I think, you know, when we're talking about Grant's new book, Globalization and the American Worker, um, negotiating a new social contract, all you have to do is look to the Wall Street Journal today um, for what kind of impact this book's having. I mean, many of you have seen the headline, Global econom Economy Gains Steam, Jobs Still a Worry. So I think that's, that's a perfect way to get into um, some of the issues that Grant's covered here in his book. You know, this book is divided into four parts, and, and it begins, the study begins with an examination of the changes uh, facing American workers and the transformational importance of globalization and technological change. The book then moves on to consider the real implications, the implications of these um, changes for the workplace and the workforce. And the third part of the book uh, reviews the, the current private sector and public policy responses to these changes, um, those that are helpful and not so helpful. And finally, the study offers recommendations for negotiating a new American social contract um, investing in American workers and creating uh, an economic uh, environment that, and, and, create, and actually enabling an economic environment. One of the things um, that really struck me about Grant's new book, um, making a national commitment to a, a social contract, is, as he says, negotiating a new social contract will require a process of building broad public support, which only the president can do. While the President has, out of necessity, had to focus on kick-starting the domestic economy at the outset of his administration, he will increasingly find that retooling the American economy to compete in a more knowledge-driven, globalized world simply cannot wait. With that, um, I can't wait to hear what Grant has to say, so I'm going to throw it to Grant, and he'll lead you through his presentation, and we'll be able to take some questions. I also should point out that we have books for sale in the back, and if you don't want to buy one, that's okay. Buy two or three, because they're great <laughs> gifts for Labor Day, which is coming up right around the corner. Well, first of all, thank you, Andrew, very, very much uh, for uh, – Andrew's one of those guys who I think uh, has followed the basic rule in public speaking, which is try and provide insight to those who are willing and ready to accept it and entertainment for the rest. And uh, <laughs> I'm assuming I'm going to try to do the same thing. But um, probably to start off, the first and most important thing I have to do is thank some people. Um, first, uh, Andreas Tricopoulos at the Nearcos Foundation, who funded most of the research uh, that went into the book over the last three years. Uh, John Hamry and my many friends here at CSIS who supported it throughout, supported my efforts throughout. Uh, and also, I, I realize now staring at all my friends in the audience, I have to thank all of you for the times I've bored you in conversation with many of these ideas. Uh, a number of the people were uh, in the room were a part of a couple of sessions we had early on that were simply trying to frame the issues uh, that became the body of the book. And I was telling Joe Kennedy, uh, who uh, was uh, not only from Minnesota and a colleague at the Commerce Department, but now is at the Pew uh, Foundation, that, you know, I didn't start out to write a book. I really thought, you know, this was something that would we'd get it out. It would be one of those nice tight Washington things with lots of recommendations in the back. But what I realized I was going to have to do was actually kick over the traces of a debate that's gone on for 15 years on globalization, and that has, in many respects, driven itself into a cul-de-sac. Uh, 
And my sense was, like I've often said about the Doha round, that if we just accelerate, we're going to find ourselves in our neighbor's house rather than actually trying to get to our goal. And part of the book and trying to dig out what was going on with globalization was trying to find a way to explore why uh, we'd gotten into the ditch, but also how we would get out of it as a practical matter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through um, a series of slides which uh, don't spend a lot of time on globalization, actually. Um, and I'm happy to come back to that in the Q&A. Uh, don't want to spend a lot of time with the forces driving it, uh, but that's an important part of it. I really want to get to just sort of a pastiche of some of the numbers uh, that should be driving us to think about human capital as the principal American response to globalization. Uh, I will spend some time talking about why trade policy and trade policy tools are completely inapposite to the challenges we face competing in a global economy, and that because we have a trade debate, uh, or we, that our principal response to globalization has taken the form of a trade policy debate, there's a tendency to think in terms of trade policy tools as the solution. And unfortunately, that is completely the wrong way to try and approach how we grapple with giving American workers the tools to succeed in a, as I say, a more knowledge-driven, globalized economy. Um, the genesis, a lot of this work, I should say, started actually when I was working on the Hill, um, both in terms of uh, grappling with uh, the, an ill-informed trade policy debate, uh, but also in trying to reform a program called Trade Adjustment Assistance. And for those of us who have had to work on TAA and recognized fairly early on that it wasn't capable of coming to grips with what American workers faced uh, as they went through jobs adjustment, it was sort of an insight into the direction we ought to be going. But let's start with why we're here. The benefits of globalization starts out where essentially 10 percent of U.S. GDP is a benefit of our openness to the global economy. Uh, so anything that puts that at risk essentially is going to lop 10 percent off the U.S. economy. Now, I know that's a rough measure, but it translates into $10,000 for a family of four at a median income of $48,000. So roughly 20 percent of their annual income is at risk if you get the globalization debate wrong. What's interesting, too, is that, you know, we've come to this point in terms of trade policy where it doesn't look like the administration has a trade policy, and it doesn't look like we're going to make any progress until after the midterm elections in 2010, if then. And if that's the case, what you're putting at risk is another $500 billion in annual GDP, because we're not going to be making progress in terms of trying to deliver. The other thing that I wanted to comment on was the extent to which, because it's been a trade policy debate, the politics of this has become inverted. Um, we have a tendency to forget, and indeed, uh, Secretary of State Clinton, when she was running for the presidency had gone so far as to say the law of comparative advantage no longer applied uh, in a more globalized uh, economy. And the point that I want to make is a lot of the truisms that we've always thought about trade still prevail. In fact, trade liberalization serves people at the bottom of the pyramid. The most regressive taxes we impose in our system in the United States are, in fact, tariffs. If you look at this, you'll see that over half the revenue is on shoes and clothing alone. Uh, so for the single mom was going to Walmart to make sure that the kids have jeans without patches in them uh, to go to school, they're paying $2,000 a year annually, of which 400 bucks is basically tariffs. And the highest tariff, interestingly enough, is on the lowest cost sneakers. So if what you're trying to do is just let your kid go to gym class relative to the people in this room walking around and find Italian shoes, the fact is you're going to end up paying about 67 percent of the value of that shoe. Now, the point I make with that is that, ironically, we have a trade debate that somehow now says that trade liberalization is at odds with workers' interests. And the question that I think we have to come to grips with is why, and then what do we do to address that in terms of a public policy response? So. I describe this more as weighing those benefits, which we all talk about. You know, I feel like when I talk about the benefits of globalization, it's a little bit like trying to explain uh, the law of comparative advantage again, uh, which doesn't impress any worker I've ever met when I try and do that as a practical matter. Um, it doesn't, uh, doesn't impress my son Noah when I've tried many, many times either. And uh, I've gradually come to realize the wisdom of uh, what R the physicist Richard Feynman said about relativity, which is you never understand it, you just get used to it. Yeah, and I, I think that's sort of where I am on comparative advantage at this point. But the important thing here is to contrast the benefits I was just describing with the experience of American workers. 
And that explains a lot about the insecurity that American workers feel and why the trade policy debate has become inverted, or the globalization debate has become inverted. First of all, declining job security. If you look roughly over the last 25 years, you've seen average job tenure go from about 13 years with a particular employer down to below 10. Uh, stagnating wages, particularly at the bottom of the scale. Uh, there have been some more interesting things more recently where it's actually been college graduates who suffered more in terms of the downward pressure on wages, which is one of the reasons why trade isn't actually an explanation for a lot of this. But the important thing to realize is you really have had stagnating wages for roughly 30 years, uh, wage compression. Um, increasing income disparity. So you can see that the gains are going to the people at the top. Now, many people view that as a social issue. Uh, it is, but the truth is, is that it has a lot to do with something we're going to come to later, which is the skill bias and the technological change we've seen over the last 30 years. The rewards are going to the people with the skills that match the needs of this globalized economy. But to understand this best is really to think about a vice. You have this downward pressure on wages, to which trade undoubtedly contributes. But much of it flows from the other forces that are driving globalization. And the other problem is that you have this upward pressure on three of the most significant factors on family income. So if you think about the American dream as something where the average worker educates themselves and has that opportunity for upward mobility, think about what this means for their liquidity when they're trying to, as a family, pay for their children's education. If you think about the progress and the aspirations we have in our families and with our children, that vice means that you can see a future that doesn't look as good for your kids as it did for you as a practical matter. And so you can try and find a couple of ways to grapple with that. Obviously, the current political debate is trying to grapple with health care costs. But I have to say, much of what I think is the answer is grappling with the supply side and ensuring the productivity gains that workers create flow back to their paychecks, which is part of what hasn't happened over the last 30 years. Because as you know, particularly in the 90s and uh, in this decade, we've actually had pretty remarkable productivity gains. But what the numbers tell you is they haven't actually flowed back to uh, the workers that in many respects create those. So that obviously reinforces a rising populism. Uh, these numbers come from NBC Wall Street Journal polls, and they've been tracking this really since we, uh, about the time of the battle in Seattle, I think, for all of you WTO experts. But they, they started to look at what was behind the anti-globalization movement. And what they came up with, of course, was this tracking that they've now done for a decade. And what it shows is, is that that insecurity that we saw in the last chart is flowing through to opinions about globalization. The rhetoric about globalization is that it is trade that and the addition of two billion workers in the form of China and India joining the global economy that are creating this downward pressure. And that has a lot of resonance. And as you can see, those supporting uh, the idea that trade agreements help the U.S. has fallen precipitously as well. And what's intriguing about that is that recent fall in those numbers tracks the downward pressure on wages of the college educated. Uh, college educated were the strongest supporters of free trade as a policy, and that's eroded as their economic circumstances eroded. So while I wouldn't want to say it's a causal connection, I say there's a strong correlation between what we saw in terms of the downward pressure on wages, particularly for people uh, with a college education and then the erosion of support. Now, what's interesting about this is that while we tend, for those of us who work in trade, we think about the political problem that Democrats face in creating the political space to move ahead with a trade policy agenda that's uh, about liberalization, about trying to expand opportunities for American exporters and, and for American workers in those enterprises. But the important thing is to understand that this populism is crossing the aisle. Uh, now, it metastasizes in two different ways. On, among Democrats, it's a trade policy debate. Among Republicans, it's an immigration debate. But the motivation behind it is that we can somehow build a wall around our prosperity, which we can't. Uh, the reality is it didn't even work when there were castles and moats. You know, they always found a way to take some dead corpse and throw it over the parapet and <laughs> infect everybody inside. And it's the same thing if we try and close off our economy as a practical matter. Uh, but what's interesting to see is that this is a broad paradigm shift in politics that isn't limited to one party. This really is a rising populism that's affecting the policy across the board. Now, is trade to blame? Uh, 
I want to preface all this by saying the basic conclusion I reach in the book is that the debate we've had about whether trade is to blame or whether it's technology or other things is essentially sterile. The reality is is you can't segregate the different eddies in this current. The current of globalization has become a thing in and of itself, and it's not something you can actually strip down. The best estimates come from Robert Lawrence of Harvard, who basically has said trade may contribute 10 percent of what we see in terms of wage fluctuations. The rest of it is coming from other forces that are driving globalization. Um, but it, what, what even that number belies, for those of you who know trade well, is that the actual degree of trade liberalization is pretty limited. It's limited to industrial goods. If you think about the WTO, uh, what we haven't done is a lot to impose any discipline on agriculture or lower barriers. We essentially have capped the ability to raise barriers on uh, agriculture. And on services, the commitments apart from developed countries in financial services and telecommunications are relatively limited. The United States is stands alone in terms of its willingness to liberalize on services. Uh, efforts in terms of free trade agreements, frankly, have not been negotiated with partners that are large enough to make a huge difference in this equation. So even where you did get greater services liberalization or more discipline and market access in agriculture, the actual degree of liberalization is still fairly limited. And the thing that I think, find much more interesting is I started to track um, the onset of specific trade agreements with the fluctuation in wages. So at the broadest level, you see trade liberalization going on over the last 60 years. In the last 30 years, you see this wage compression. But if you look within the last 30 years at every time we've opened up, what you don't see is something that correlates with a downward pressure on wages. If you think about NAFTA and its implementation, what you actually saw was real income, particularly for people at the bottom, rising including in industries like textiles, ironically. And so what you, you see is a picture that suggests or should suggest to you that there are other forces that are driving much of what we see in terms of the wages and what's driving the insecurity among Americans. But more importantly, the trade policy debate is obscuring the real challenge. We're now living in a world that is roughly 40 years beyond the political debate, the, the way the political debate is structured and how we think about trade and about globalization is a picture from the 1960s. It thinks of trade as an arm's length transaction between independent buyers and sellers in different countries. It doesn't think of what are, have now actually gone beyond global supply chains. They've really become ecosystems. The interaction among the different participants in a global supply chain is so thick that you, what you've actually done is soften the borders of enterprises. You no longer have vertically integrated multinational corporations that are doing much of their production in one place and then outsourcing bits of it. In fact, what you have are global enterprises that are made up of the supply chain. And so the idea that we have a tax code that thinks about nationality and the headquarters of a corporation in this world that has now shifted beyond that paradigm means that our public policies have yet to catch up. And that's certainly true for those of us who've been in the trade policy debate. The reality is when you hear people talk about the idea that we could raise uh, tariffs or impose anti-dumping duties, uh, my first reaction is to pull up my BlackBerry and say, but I'm getting financial services and health care delivered to my phone. You know, there's nothing about an anti-dumping duty that's going to impinge on the ability for me to receive that. That's the effect of globalization that's not captured in that static view of the global economy. What it's done is redrawn economic boundaries. Um, if you think about it, it's not just softening the lines and the borders of, of uh, enterprise, it's, it's softening the borders of countries. A good example would be the auto industry. What's the first thing that happens when GM starts to run into trouble in the United States? The Canadians and the Swedes get excited, right? Why? Well, we started out with a production sharing agreement across the Canadian border in, David, forgive me, 65, I think. And then we went from there to NAFTA, and first the FTA and then NAFTA. And then in, you've got this production network on a North American basis that leads Toyota to invest in San Antonio and its truck plant precisely so it can pull in the value of that entire supply chain and sell into the U.S. market. And in one sense, what you're seeing is it's no longer when we're making trade policy or our economic policies that we only have an impact within the confines of the United States because of the way things have been organized. 
But the most powerful point that I want to make is really that we've crossed a Rubicon. In 2003, more than 50% of world trade was in intermediate goods, the goods that are just moving back and forth within these ecosystems that cross borders. So you can see the erosion of that idea of the arm's length thing that I was talking about, that picture, that static picture we have. That's basically gone. The other thing is, and this I think is the critical point that's lost on most people, is that the other Rubicon we crossed was in 2005. The developing world now represents more than 50% of world GDP and considerably more than half of all the economic growth. And the more interesting point is that China and India only represent 25% of that growth. So what you've got is this broad-based rise in incomes in the developing world that represent the markets of the future. And that is not a picture that's caught by the static one we had from uh, the 1960s. Uh, the implications from U.S. workers, this is a lot of uh, text on a page, but basically what I started to think about was when, you, when you, you hear someone like Hillary Clinton say that comparative advantage no longer applies, there's actually some rationale for saying the conventional explanation of comparative advantage and the medium through which it operates is no longer consistent with what we see in the global marketplace, the picture I had of these ecosystems. But it doesn't mean that comparative advantage has ceased to apply. It's just that we have yet to capture fully the medium through which it's operating in these ecosystems. My point is, is that comparative advantage, so I guess I am going to talk about comparative advantage, but the, but the, the comparative advantage is really about specialization. You remember that Adam Smith's principal insight and that Ricardo built on was that specialization and trade allowed for productivity gains. And it was the productivity gains that drove growth and a rise in the standards of living. And so the essence of trade was simply to create expanded opportunities for that specialization to take place that raised productivity overall and allowed individuals, in effect, to contribute to the society's economic development. Well, globalization multiplies those opportunities. So in that framework, you have to say what drives specialization and then what become the differentiating factors we ought to look at from the point of view of an American worker. And in this context, it's innovation that drives the specialization. And what that means is that the talent and ideas become the differentiating factors in the global economy. The skills that are needed in this more knowledge-driven globalized economy define whether or not a worker succeeds or not. In other words, human capital at the end of the day. Now, I have to say, I think the most interesting thing I've read, which I recommend to all of you, is not this goofy book in the back with, you know, moral, high moral sentiments and woolly-headed economics, but it is a book by uh, Claudia Golden and Larry Katz of Harvard called The Race Between Education and Technology. Because uh, it, what Claudia and, and Larry are people who are, among economists, revered for their ability to mine the data. And what they did was they explored what happened at the early part of the 20th century and the early part of the later, latter part of the 20th century, early part of the 21st. And what it showed won't surprise you if I say it in words. The technological change that you saw at the start of the 20th century was just as profound as the technolo technological change we're seeing now. We don't think about it that way because, you know, suddenly that ENIAC original computer is now has less computing power than my BlackBerry. But the reality is the shift from like steam to electricity and what that meant for the reorganization of production, the way that complemented what Ford did, which was create not only a system of interchangeable parts but interchangeable workers, was just as profound in our shift from an agricultural nation to a manufacturing nation as the current shift is. Their point was, and this is the really powerful point that reinforces what I was saying a second ago about the differentiating factors, is that the skills needed in mass manufacturing favored the unskilled. And at the same time, they were complemented by a high school movement. So our human capital policies, such as they were at the beginning of the 20th century, consisted of trying to get everybody to graduate from high school, which turned out the literate and numerate individuals you needed for mass manufacturing. Unfortunately, what you've got now going on in, as we go into the 21st century is that all the technological change is skill biased. To live and operate in this new world, you actually need a higher order of skills. And much of it is because the competition at the end of the day is not between high wage and low wage workers. It's whether or not your job can be turned into an algorithm that a computer can run. 
And if the computer can run it, whether it's conventionally a computer, it's a numerically controlled machine tool, ultimately what you end up with is uh, the machine has the comparative advantage. And what that means is, is that the nature of skills that you use and the judgment you exercise and the context you provide within which this, operate, this machine operates is the critical set of skills. What that means also is you need a huge investment to pull people up this chain in terms of their human capital to allow them to succeed, but also to allow them to raise their productivity in a way that would affect their income at the end of the day. All right. Well, what that said to me was that we need to draw this conversation out into the open. Uh, leaving this as sort of an academic exercise never makes a lot of sense. What you actually need to do is say starkly, we really don't have a choice other than globalization. It's not going away. People talk about it being reversible because an archduke got shot in 1914, and that ended the first great wave of globalization with World War I. But the reality is many of the forces that are driving this change will mean that other conflicts could emerge but the globalization as we know it is not going away. We really don't have any choice but to embrace it. So then the question is, what's the counterpart? Going back to that question of the insecurity workers feel, and in my view, it's investing in the skills that they need to compete and providing an enabling economic environment. That's really the two principal things we have to do. So at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is how do we make that investment and what form does it take? Now, what I'm gonna to start to go through are just some elements of that real quickly that are um, I wouldn't pretend it's a monopoly on the truth, uh, but I would say that this is where the debate has to take place. Uh, I'm going to start in a weird sort of place with a Head Start program. You know, you think about worker skills, you don't think about Head Start, uh, but there's a reason. It turns out James Heckman, who's a Nobel laureate at the University of Chicago, has done an enormous amount of work, and much of what happens in your early years means that your economic future is baked in the cake. So that unless you affect early learning, all that does is reproduce the same problems at each level of education and in a career. And so probably the most dramatic thing I'm suggesting is we actually need to expand public education down to the earliest years of life. And I think we have to have a counterpart, given the constraints that families have, to the Family Medical Leave Act, which I know upsets employers. And I don't mean exactly the Family Medical Leave Act, but it's a good metaphor. I think what families need is the opportunity for a few hours a week actually to spend time in school with their children as a part of the educational process. Um, I know that certainly when I talk with my, uh, my sister-in-law, who's a principal out in uh, Fairfax County, uh, she, and works in one of the most challenging school environments in the country, um, she always says, I, I, I'm not doing fine with the kids. If I had the parents and I could teach them a little bit, I'd be so much better off. And I, I want to make that possible. Right? These two things have to fit together. And the interesting thing is, this is what the Head Start program does. The Head Start program obliges the parents to be a part of the process. It's not something where you simply park your kids and head off to work. And so I want that model. I don't want the traditional public school model. I actually want the Head Start model as a part of that early education. We can use the infrastructure we have to reduce the cost, but what we really have to do is find a way to encourage that sort of level of learning, both among parents and children. Um, that goes to what I would describe as one of the higher order values. It's not economics, it's just the equal opportunity that we're reaching for at that point. Primary and secondary education, desperate need to reform the curriculum. Um, we've had debates about, uh, about uh, school choice and about standards. Uh, you know, I'm actually not interested in that debate all that much. The truth is, is that the curriculum that we're teaching is the same curriculum we were teaching for an economy that was about mass manufacturing. And it's not about that higher order set of skills, about context, about judgment, about managing information, which is really what most jobs will be about, even if you're a steel worker going forward. And so a change in the curriculum, consultation really between the schools and the private sector so that you understand what the market is demanding in the way of skills. Um, well, the one way I wanted to try and tackle something, which I, the more I read about this, the more I felt uh, we have an unconscionable problem in America. As long as our public education system is tied to local school taxes, which everybody loves local school control, but the reality is education and your future employment opportunities become a lottery by birth. And we've got to find a way to come to grips with that. Well, the one way I could think about trying to preserve local control of schools but still create new opportunities was where we ought to start with all this idea of implementing broadband Americas in the schools. 
we ought to be investing. So every school in America, think about this as like the national highway system of uh, this century. We ought to have every school soaked in the technologies that our children will have to be able to use successfully to be able to achieve anything in this global economy. And it would be a way of offsetting the necessary discrimination that goes along with a system that's tied to local property taxes for its financing. Last thing is you've got to raise teacher salaries. And what I say that is not, you know, for the benefit of the folks in the teachers' union, <laughs> because I think all those guys are going to have to recompete for these new jobs at higher salary levels. The point is, is that if you the, the critical thing, um, interesting enough, this is just reflected in the latest issue of uh, U.S. News and World Report. The critical differentiating factor in the schools are teachers, and it's not class size, even though that would help. But what you really need are teachers who increasingly know the subject matter very well, but are also very adept at communicating, and which are not easy skills, as we all know. Uh, you can always point to that one teacher, in my case it was Mrs. Smith in the fifth grade, that actually made the, all the difference in your, in your sort of young years of getting you to study. But Mrs. Smith was pretty unique even in my day when, you know, we kept women out of the rest of the workforce and they all became teachers, right? We had a deeper pool of very highly qualified people that were teaching us, and she still stood out. What that means is, particularly in this market, you're going to have to bid talent away from other careers, and that's going to take money at the end of the day to affect individual choices. Uh, Post-secondary education, it's principally a liquidity constraint. Remember that vice I was describing early on? Uh, what we're seeing is, you know, there's a number of standard ways to come at that. I, I like the idea of allowing people to save, uh, to get, let them keep their money rather than giving it to the federal government. Uh, that's a predilection on my part. Uh, since my wife used to be Assistant Secretary of Tax Policy and she resents spending through the tax code, uh, I now, it won't surprise you, favor Pell Grants rather than uh, spending through the tax code. Uh, but the principal problem with Pell Grants and all the things that we do to try and uh, allow people to afford uh, college at this point is that they are dedicated to individual groups instead of recognizing that what we have is a problem that affects every student who needs to get some post-secondary training at this point. And so you really need to expand the definition of Pell Grant to apply more broadly to families at a median income. Uh, and renationalizing Sally Mae so you can pass the cost savings on. I know that's anathema for many of my friends on the Republican side, but um, and I, I don't think government is a very efficient financial mechanism, but where we are right now with Sally Mae makes no sense. You have a very high cost uh, operation and you have an awful lot of people that are facing financial constraints. And in some respects, this is our seed corn to be able to compete in the global economy, and I'm willing to make the investment to <laughs> reacquire Sally Mae to get more of that seed corn out there is really what I'm saying. Uh, lifetime learning, we have a number of obstacles I would call anti-adjustment measures. Uh, a good example is our tax code prevents you, think about it this way, a market now treats an individual worker as their own enterprise. Increasingly, you have to pay for your own health insurance, you have to pay for all the other things that are a part of building a career, you have to be looking ahead to make sure that you see where your industry is going so you make the right choices about what you do with your life. But the tax code says you can't treat yourself the way the market is trying to treat you, right? If you wanted to make an investment in a new career, you couldn't deduct that on your taxes. You couldn't even treat it as a capital investment, which is what it is, right? So until the first step in this lifetime learning process is to eliminate a lot of the anti-adjustment policies. But the other thing that we really ought to be doing is trying to expand uh, the opportunities for innovations. So IBM has got a good one. It's essentially a 401k plan for education, uh, which uh, again, would involve uh, tax consequences. Adjustment and retraining, um, all this is to say that basically we've got to break the link between trade and, and our adjustment policies. The idea that the adjustment we're seeing is driven by trade, you know where I started out in the presentation, what we really need is a comprehensive adjustment policy that applies to every worker. And the goal actually should be trying to encourage them to get as quickly back to work as possible. The program we have you're really obliged to get out of uh, the out of your employment and take the training, and as a part of that process, your skills are eroding in a in an economy where uh, the pace of change is accelerating. So the goal of the new program has to be to get people back to work as quickly as possible, rather than getting them out and training. What that means is a practical matter of subsidizing the cost of on-the-job training, rather than what we do conventionally, which is tell you to go off to the junior college. Love the junior colleges; they do great work. But the reality is, most good learning you do is on the job and more importantly, the market-relevant learning that you do is on the job. So the goal has to be get people back to work. <laughs>
create an enabling economic environment. I'm really only going to spend time on the first one here. Um, I, my own reaction is I'd love to see the current tax code simplified, those disincentives I described we ought to get rid of. But the more I start to think about human capital and the need for us to invest, the need for individuals to invest in themselves, it drives you in the direction of a value-added tax. Why? Because we have a false claim to progressivity in the current tax code. The reality is, is that a family, a, a median family at that $48,000 salary I was talking about pays the same effective tax rate when FICA is added in as a family at $150,000. In other words, you got a flat tax in a horribly complex tax system. Why not eliminate the disincentive for investing in human capital that the progressivity in the current tax code represents? And the VAT has other benefits, which is it would make the United States more competitive on global markets because we suffer with the current tax arrangement under the current WTO rules. Um, trade policy, um, I describe this as focusing on what matters. Having accused uh, my good friend Bob Zellick once or twice that we were negotiating uh, free trade agreements with the outer asteroid belt in uh, commercial terms, <laughs> what I wanted to say was we needed to focus on things that mattered. If you're really going to convince the American public that we should move ahead with trade policy, you really had to say there was something on the other end, that there was a payoff, right, commercially, that it really would result in jobs. Well, that means negotiating with bigger partners, and it means uh, refocusing our efforts on the multilateral process as opposed to bilaterals. The other thing I'd say is that in negotiating these arrangements, part of what we have to do is reach beyond the conventional stuff we've all talked about as, as folks following the trade debate. Um, increasingly, what we need to be negotiating are actually the underlying premises of a market economy. In other words, if I think about China, there's always this debate about China's currency. But to me, the problem in China that we end up seeing as a trade problem is actually a financial system that doesn't work. It doesn't allocate capital in a way that would eliminate distortions in the Chinese market. And what that does is subsidize things like lots of steel mills when there's plenty of excess capacity worldwide. And eventually, when the economy turns down, that spills onto global markets. We see it, and it becomes a series of anti-dumping actions or uh, 401 actions on uh, tires, right? But the essence of the problem lies in the premises on which the Chinese financial market operates. So in bargaining, we're reaching well beyond border measures, and what we really ought to be talking about are do we agree on a common set of premises so that the feeling of unfairness that these things, these distortions generate is something we come to grips with as a part of uh, trade policy. And then lastly, I wanted to make a pitch here. Um, I spent a lot of time in the book on labor, some of it negative in terms of labor's involvement in uh, thwarting progress on trade which serves workers and makes the point implicitly that they represent a slice of American workers, but they don't represent American workers' interests when they're opposing trade liberalization. On the other hand, labor actually invests an enormous amount of money in training people. In fact, the private sector as a whole invests ten times as much as the government does in, in, in training people. What's interesting about that is a fair share of that is driven by the craft unions who actually decide who's going to be hired for a particular job, carpenters, things like that. But what that means is, is that there's an opening for labor and management to break what has been a long-standing problem in labor and management relations and opt for a new model. Um, it's already been done in the steel industry, and all, all it does is link wages directly to productivity gains so that the interests of the employees are aligned with the interests of the company in terms of trying to increase its productivity and its profitability down the road. And that's the model that we need to bring uh, together. And it's a contribution, I think, the private sector can make to this process. And lastly, in terms of where Andrew started out making a national commitment, a lot of this really does depend on the president. Um, if you're going to take all that stimulus money, uh, I'd be investing it in schools and education. And I'd be invested in this, these elements of a social contract. Because until I think we have that level of national commitment to our workforce, will have missed the underlying anxiety that is thwarting our ability to capture the gains of globalization. We'll also have missed the opportunity to create that profoundly leveling effect that a better educational system would provide. So, sorry, I'm, I was very long-winded as usual, but let me stop there and throw it open for questions. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, I would like to suggest that you know, I'm going to send my good friend Tim Reif a book, <laughs> along with the slides. But I can, I can tell you, 
Tim and I have had this conversation over a 12-year period, and I think Tim gets it. <laughs> the problem, of course, is that, you know, given health care, given climate change, the idea that the administration will take up trade policy at any time soon is unlikely in the extreme. And equally important, I mean, as soon as Kirk suggested on that conference call yesterday that there would be a speech, the White House then immediately shot that down. So the reality is, is that they're being – Disciplined about their message in a very unfortunate way. And I think, in all honesty, I think until the President is called out on the hypocrisy of a foreign policy that claims to rebuild, rebuild America's standing in the world and then goes and talks to the developing nations of the world and refuses to talk about the one thing they want to talk about, which is trade, until somebody actually confronts the administration in a setting like the G20 that we're not satisfied with the rhetoric of saying we need to conclude Doha. No, we actually need to conclude Doha. Or we need to get off that track and find something new that would allow us to move ahead, both for the benefit of the United States, American workers, and for the developing world. But I think until we get there, we're not going to see a lot of progress on trade. Yeah, hey, Joe. All this, uh, basically, the end you're, you're trying to get after uh, requires a whole bunch of government agencies to work in concert. <laughs> how, how do you rally agencies around a goal like competitiveness that is so crucial to the U.S. future? Yeah, I mean, it, it, Joe, you know this from our experience together at the Commerce Department with the manufacturing report. You know, simply trying to get the people at the White House to realize they had a political problem that they had to grapple with and have a strategy for was hard, much less to get other agencies interested in the idea. And what you need was leadership. You know, there, there's no substitute for the president taking on the challenge. And in one sense, when Arne Duncan comes out with the Race to the Top program, you want to applaud that. And I'd love to see that succeed. Uh, but you also know that it's incomplete, given the challenge we're facing. And so what I think, the reason I pose this as negotiating a new social contract is I'm trying to create the political space in one sense, Joe, for the president to say, that's an issue that I could seize and we can take on the competitiveness challenge where you could then draw out internationalists among Democrats and Republicans who want to support trade liberalization and a social agenda that marries with that that would bring a lot of other support in the Democratic Party. In other words, if you're going to create the political space for the president to succeed for him to lead, you've got to present this sort of paradigm in one sense so that he can see how he can translate that into the politics of his own party, which is going to predominate for the foreseeable future. So that's definitely the goal. you got your finger right on it. But it's got to start at the top. Please. Yeah, I guess very interested in the political side. And I was focused specifically on the idea of delinking uh, trade adjustment assistance from trade. And I've been talking to people on the Democratic Republican side about this for actually a couple of years. Yeah. And there's a huge political problem I run into. If you talk to Republicans, it's basically we'll never pay for what that would really cost. And if you talk to Democrats, it's this issue of basically we're saying that we – well, one, you take away the political capital for them to pass trade deals, and two, also it's sort of an admission that we haven't really been doing a program that's worked for decades. So, Yeah, I think that the, the, let me deal with the second one first. The premise is just wrong. The idea that TAA pays for anything in terms of further trade liberalization is a joke. I mean, this is something we should do because we have a different sort of challenge. It's not to pass trade agreements. It's because we legitimately have workers who, if they're going to, if they're going to be able to succeed and we're going to succeed as a society, this is the investment we have to make. So that's the starting point. But, you know, from the point of view of folks on the Democratic side, particularly the left of the Democratic Party, SOP, like a $2 billion TAA program, is not going to get them to overcome the longstanding opposition they've had with respect to moving on trade liberalization. So the premise is wrong there. The, the flip side of it, from a Republican perspective, part of it is one of the reasons I, I use human capital here, which is it's not only correct, and, you know, you can go back to a Nobel laureate like Gary Becker to give you the economics of it, and so that it's got a justification, but it all is also to put what we're doing in an investment context. I want to get my friends on the Republican side of the aisle comfortable with the idea that government does have a very big role here. And its role is actually making the invest, realigning the incentives in the economy so that people can invest in themselves, first and foremost, that enabling economic environment, but then making the sort of investments that would allow that idea of upward mobility in the American dream to continue to exist, right? So if I'm going to speak to my Republican friends, that's the side that I'm going to focus on. Because really, when you say pay for it, I mean, I, in work I did with Matt Slaughter and Robert Lawrence, we ran the numbers in terms of what you would do just with a, a, a comprehensive adjustment program. 
relative to the amount of change we're throwing at General Motors and auto parts suppliers, it really is a small, it's jump change. You know, it's like 20 billion. And I'm not saying that's small because it's ultimately taxpayers, but we actually included a model which allowed for a very small increase in FICA and you could cover the expense of most of what we had as an adjustment policy. Now what I'm talking about is much more comprehensive than just an adjustment policy, but the argument that there's a lot to be paid for under a comprehensive TAA program I don't actually think withstands scrutiny because we were talking about wage insurance, we were talking about uh, broad retraining programs, a variety of things, and you were still looking at a $20 billion price tag. That to me, given the $500 billion that's on the table, much less than $1.4 trillion that's at risk, if you see retrograde motion here, is worth the investment. Yeah, Phil. Grant, um, you were talking about in, in the trade policy context, the WTO, that what it really should be grappling with is the sort of fundamental premises. What do you see as the prospects of reaching a consensus among 150 or so countries yeah, on, those on those fundamental premises of how an economy works? Yeah, Phil, zero. You know, I mean, <laughs> the, the reality is, is that you, you have to opt for a variable geometry here. It has to be a two-speed process. What we have to do is go back to the technology we used in the Tokyo round. You couldn't bring people along on a subsidies code and an anti-dumping code, right? So what you had, and believe me, I mean, we'd had our own problems with Congress with an anti-dumping code in 1969 at the Kennedy round. So now you're looking at something where you say, I've got to make a much more profound change. And what I would suggest the vehicle is, is that you negotiate a free trade agreement within the WTO, subject to WTO dispute settlement, of whoever's willing to come along. And you challenge the United States, Europe, and Japan to lead I'd also say that on preference programs, you leave them for the least developed and not for the Indias of the world and not for the Brazils of the world. And I know my friends in Brazil and India always protest when I say this. But they have access to investment capital, which is what these programs are designed to do. They're designed to attract investment capital. So frankly, they're out. And you know what I'm trying to do. I'll be very blunt about it. I'm trying to create a vice, you know, so that there's a huge incentive them to move up toward liberalization. And then in negotiating that, I think you have to reach well beyond that, that free trade deal. It actually has to be the underlying premises of how you want a common economy to operate. And that does mean grappling with things like how are you going to do agricultural price support. That could create a very strong incentive for the developing world to follow with liberalization of their own, particularly of Brazil, for example. But that's what I want to do. I essentially want to create an incentive for the developing world to come and join the folks who want to start negotiating the underlying premises of a market economy that would work. And I want to create as much pressure from the bottom from new competitors to compel them essentially to move in the direction of that broader liberalization and then clean out the distortions like I mentioned in the Chinese financial sector. It's a, b it's a tall order. I don't deny it. And it's a very different paradigm. And what it means is you've got to recognize that Doha is dead and you have to move on. Right? But it's time to recognize that. And in one sense, it would match what the administration is doing. You know, we have a strategic pause now whether we like it or not. So we might as well make use of the strategic pause and actually start to rethink the fundamentals of our approach on the multilateral side as well. Sure. Grant, good to see you again. And, good uh, to see you. Great speech. Um, very insightful. I want to uh, well, kind of looked, go well, I don't know if it was insightful. It was restful. <laughs> Looking at the audience, I saw that it was very restful. <laughs> no, but I think, you know, in terms of the relationship of the education and the global trade that you pointed up is, to me at least, is very insightful. I would like to ask a question along that line of education. It seems for the up to the high school level, lots of issues in the education system and you know there is a lot of focus on it and then the higher education so it looks like if everything goes right even today uh, the people who will graduate they will be very productive in the economy to do all these knowledge worker things and uh, maybe 10 years 12 years down the line and so the question I'm thinking of are we going to have a big time lag and the world may change so much by that time that whatever we do now is useless so well, I would like to really know if we should be pessimistic or should we say, look, let's just do this very fast and we can still catch the wave. And, and my reaction is, is that in the United States, you have two very powerful things going for you, which means that we've got the time to make the investments for education to pay off. You're absolutely right. If you're investing in primary education or early learning, it's a very long cycle before that affects your economic productivity. You know, it's a little bit like the old line about computers. You see them everywhere except in the productivity statistics. It'll be the same thing with our investments in early education. That won't pay off for 20 years. But I also know that without creating that foundation, you're marginalizing a part of our economy that we can't afford to marginalize. So I want to make that investment. 
The other things that are built in to try and reduce the liquidity trap for parents who are trying to get their kids through college or some other post-secondary training, uh, the adjustment assistance program is really designed to address needs now. And that, in a broader sense, is designed to uh, create the opportunity for more public support for liberalization. I'm not linking that to a trade agreement specifically, like TAA, we pass more TAA, we get to pass a, an agreement with Columbia. What I'm suggesting is, is that you're really interested in reshaping public opinion about our engagement in the global economy and the investments in a stronger social safety net that is pointed to getting people back to work is actually the most productive way to try and address that. I, I actually am optimistic, and here I want to come back to a point. The thing that I've sort of struggled with recently, which Phil knows because I've peppered him with lots of questions, is, you know, okay, what is the medium through which comparative advantage does work in a modern global economy? And the best I can tell is that what globalization has done is reinforce the importance of institutions, private property, uh, you know, the depth and liquidity of your financial markets, uh, your school system, um, in terms of the influence it has over both your competitiveness but also the shape of your comparative advantage. If you think about strong intellectual property laws, in this world what it may bias you toward is a research-based economy if other people have weaker standards. Our comparative advantage is based on those institutional arrangements in some respects. The other thing is that and this, I think, is actually one of the critical things. I'm glad you asked the question in this sense, is that the other thing that's most important is that in a time of rapid and accelerating economic change, the ability to adjust, flexibility itself, is both a competitive advantage and folds back on your comparative advantage. Now, the important thing to understand is the United States is just absolutely the world class in terms of those institutional arrangements. And, and I know people will dispute this, but you know, the World Economic Forum, for what it's worth, keeps giving us very high rankings, and most of it's on the strength of our institutional arrangements, freedom of contract, property rights, intellectual property protection, things like that. The other thing is the flexibility of our uh, industry and our workforce, including the entrepreneurial side of it and the seed corn of the economy that creates most of the new jobs. That part of it is the best in the world. And in one sense, we're living off those strengths right now. So I think we've got time to do this, but I think we've got to start making these investments now because even on things like venture capital, everybody's catching up, right? People are wise to the fact that entrepreneurialism drives growth in a market economy. And so you see this bubbling in China and India and everywhere else. So we're going to have to be wise about making an investment in this asset, this most important asset, our workforce, if we're going to be able to compete a decade from now. But I actually think there's some hope if you made this the focus of your response to globalization rather than this sterile debate about trade policy that you could make some progress. Please. Yeah. Another point. Mm. That is, okay. uh, I wanted to look at another point in the age spectrum, that is older workers. We know, right. of course, Japan is the, the poster country, if you will, and the baby boomer generation is, as we know, aging. What in at your least I am, I'll tell you all right. <laughs> what in your scenario speaks to that? I guess it would be continuing education, encouraging industry to give older workers a shot at, at continuing their employment. And whatever else uh, do you have to, to shed light on the, the challenge we're going to face, highly trained baby boomers in this country who do face job discrimination, and we need their intelligence and their experience. How do we get it? Well, you, you sort of put your finger on the first point, on the discrimination point. Broadly writ, any form of discrimination that uh, limits the ability to make use of their talents, whether it's because of race, age, sex, whatever, uh, is anathema to this whole model. I mean, ideally what you're trying to do is create an environment where anyone can succeed who wants to succeed. My own view is that the economics, particularly the financial crisis, is going to open a lot of new prospects for people my age <laughs> because we're going to have to. Um, and that's not a bad thing. The reality is, is that one of the dangers of this re baby boom's retirement is that you so contract the workforce that's supporting the rest of the consumption in the economy that you have to drive productivity very high among the remaining workers just to keep your standard of living where it is. So the idea that more of us baby boomers decide there's a fourth career out there for us or that we want to continue what we're doing but at a reduced pace is no bad thing. And I actually think the economics currently are providing a huge incentive for that. 
Yeah, I, I do think that. And I do think that a lot of the things for someone uh, my age it should be available. So, for example, IBM in, in its KEO plan, or its education KEO plan, would say to me as a 55-year-old man that you, in fact, can start investing now and they will match whatever you invest in that educational savings account so that, and you could, that's perfectly portable. If you retire or if you go to another company, you take that with you. So there are things that are developing that actually would still affect the equation and reduce your liquidity trap in retirement of trying to gain a new set of skills. But I think all this works, and I think that there shouldn't be an age limit on when you can apply for a Pell Grant, right? You know, I mean, there, there definitely shouldn't be that, and I think particularly given the way our part of this uh, community is going to age. I think that's the, where the demand is going to be, to be honest. Yeah, yeah in back, please. The Obama administration has put an emphasis on uh, worker training with $3.4 billion in the stimulus uh, package and more recently with the Community College Initiative. And I'm wondering, I know you have doubts about the Obama administration's approach to trade, but just on the training piece, how do you think the president has done so far? Uh, it's not nearly enough, and like much of the rest of the stimulus package, it's focused on paying constituencies in the educational community rather than it is in trying to reconstruct the incentives uh, over the long term. Do, is it good to invest in junior colleges? Are they really a, a wonderful tool for retraining? Yes. But it also ignores that the more that you subsidize them, the more of a negative impact you have on the private training industry. So net, net, have you gained something in terms of the ability to translate an entire generation into people who are capable of competing in the global economy? Probably not. But my sense of where the education spending has gone has largely been to sustain uh, existing resources rather than something new. And what I'm really talking about is something additive. And so... Yeah, I'm skeptical, I have to say. I mean, I, I've been known to say that on economic policy, President Obama gets an A on deportment and sort of a D in terms of how he puts his policies together. And I have to say, I'm, well, I'm, I like the idea of the race to the top. Again, the problem that's missing here is that this is all too conventional in terms of the economic policy approach. It doesn't actually try and create economic change, which is, involves a process of realigning the incentives. Simply adding more money on top of a bad system of incentives isn't going to produce the change you want. It's true of health care as well, for that matter. Yeah, Mike. Grant, how do you get organized labor to be a positive factor for the future rather than the negative drag that it has been for so long? Yeah, and I think there's two things there, Mike. One is there's a recognition uh, politically uh, based on my conversations with the folks at the AFL-CAO and uh, their counterpart now. Um, they recognize that as much success as they've had in thwarting uh, a trade policy that was designed to progress, they now have limited their ability to affect the change they wanted to on labor rights. And they are as frustrated at this point with the Obama administration for not having an aggressive trade policy, articulating an aggressive trade policy, as anybody in business. Now, we may differ over amongst ourselves about what ought to be the content of that policy. But what I hear is that they, too, are saying we can't live where we are right now. Their workers need jobs. Their workers need markets. And so in that sense, there's a, a shift even within the labor movement with respect to what the administration is doing now. The other thing I'd say is that if you move more toward a generation of contracts that links wages to productivity, there's a much greater incentive then to try and create the markets that allows those productivities a broader plane to play out. And so changes in how you do the bargaining could make a difference. And, and also, Mike, i got to say, I've sort of had a revolution in my thinking about uh, the labor issue as well. If I was thinking about that free trade agreement I was talking about within the WTO, I actually would want a labor chapter just like the ITO originally had. And the reason is, is that if you think about trade theory, and this isn't the conventional AFL-CIO approach to the trade and labor thing, but if I'm thinking about trade theory and human capital together, I want to provide an incentive for individuals to invest in themselves. And if I deny people the ability to bargain freely for the full value of their labor and the productivity, productivity gains they create, I reduce the incentive for them to invest in themselves. So one way to think about the limitations on labor rights that you do see in the developing world is that it's an implicit limitation 
on the ability to specialize, the ability to create the same sorts of things I was talking about here. So I have to say I'm a pretty strong proponent at this point of we've got to do something constructive on labor. It is not to use trade tools to penalize people because of the model, which is largely an environmental model, as you call, in terms of litigating everything. But I do think that having ground rules about uh, how labor is treated and what rights they have in the context of a broader global economy actually starts to make a lot more sense to me, just like I feel about China's capital markets. I want the premises to be honest, open, above board, and I want to favor human freedom as a part of that. Now, does that mean that you need card check <laughs> in, uh, in the rest of the world? Absolutely not. But do I want that simple, basic rule that people can bargain freely for the full value of their labor? Absolutely. I want to see that vindicated. And frankly, the more I think about it, Mike, it's a damn shame that in the WTO, the only thing we have on labor is something that allows us to prevent imports made with prison labor. I mean, I'm not sure that people realize this, but, you know, if, if somebody, if goods were produced with slave labor, the WTO wouldn't allow us to impose a duty on it, right? And that's the way the rules are written. And that is wrong, morally. It's also wrong economically, as I was explaining earlier. So I actually think that's a direction we have to go that would bring labor along. So if what I said was, let's negotiate this free trade agreement in the WTO, we need a labor chapter there. There has to be a strong premise about what, how labor should be treated. And I draw that together with the trend that I see in their own thinking about the lack of progress they're making now with the Obama administration uh, and the lack of a trade policy. There's actually some hope that you could draw them into the conversation. But that's a process that I'm convinced will take, you know, two to three years even to start. So here's the strategic pause we have. In effect, we ought to make use of it. But part of the conversation is to bring labor in. And certainly the reason that I spend a little time on labor and management and more in the book is precisely because labor actually makes a much more profound investment in human capital than most people realize, and I think we ought to honor that. have exhausted everybody. I want to thank, uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it.